Hello, I'm Patty Simpson with Simpson Math. Let's talk about frequency distributions and different displays that we can use to show our data that we've collected. So this name Florence Nightingale may seem familiar to you. And in fact, when you hear that name, you may think of nursing. That's because she's known as the mother of nursing. But it turns out not only was she a nurse, but she was also a statistician. In fact, she was a pioneer in the field. We even have evidence of her at age nine, collecting different da data on fruits and vegetables and making tables and displays of that data. So when she became an adult, she went off to the Crimea War, Crimean War to help the British soldiers there. And when she was there, she realized that the soldiers were dying, not just from the wounds of battle, but from other diseases and other things that were things that could have been preventable. The water that was there in the camps and mice running around and, and where they were um, uh, using the bathroom, those types of things uh, were causing illness. And then also the spread of that disease throughout the camp. She realized that it wasn't just the war itself that was killing our soldiers or the soldiers, but um, also all these outside things. So she began to collect data on what was um, killing the soldiers. She did that for two years, and then she was able to, com uh, to convince um, the British government to form this Royal Commission of Inquiry on the battle conditions for the soldiers. So she had all this list of data but she knew if she took that list of data to the uh, commission that they wouldn't understand it and it might not convince them that there was anything wrong in the camps. So she famously made this polar area graph. And this polar area graph shows the deaths of the soldiers. This blue area shows um, preventable disease. And then the red area shows the wounds, the soldiers that died from wounds, and the black area shows the soldiers that died from accidents or other causes. Once she showed this display to the commission, then all of a sudden they understood that it wasn't just the wounds of battle that were killing the soldiers. And they were actually able to make some changes that helped those British soldiers. So, those displays really can help to convince people of your data. So being able to understand displays and create displays is important in statistics for representing and showing that data. Let's talk a little bit about what it means to be a distribution. A distribution is just a way to describe the structure of a particular data set. So when we um, collect our data, that distribution just talks about that shape and structure of our, of our data set. A frequency distribution is a display of the values that occur in a data set and how, um, how many of each value or range of values occurs. So you know frequency just means how many. So that's all this is, is it's just a table that shows how many or a graphic or a display that shows how many are in each category or each, um, we, we call those categories classes or bins. So the frequency, which we denote, in other words, when we write about frequency, we use this F, are the number of data values in a category. And we call those categories a class or a bin. So different um, frequency distributions can display both qualitative and quantitative data. We're going to look here in a little bit at, at various um, qualitative uh, displays, and then later uh, we'll look at quantitative displays. Some examples of frequency distribution displays are frequency tables, bar charts, dot plots, histograms, and frequency polygons. And we're gonna to learn to create these and read these over the next little bit. Let's create some frequency tables. 
Frequency tables just show the number of data values in each category for data that we've collected. It's just a way to display our data. And frequency tables can display both qualitative and quantitative data. In this video, we're just going to show qualitative uh, data. In a future video, we'll show um, quantitative data, uh, frequency tables with quantitative data. So here, let's start just by creating a frequency table with this um, data. 80 visitors to a local community college were given a choice of four gifts. 40 of the visitors chose a t-shirt, 20 chose a coffee mug, 10 chose a water bottle, and 10 chose a bumper sticker. So notice that our variable here is the gift, and so that is qualitative data. Each of those is just a category that we're placing it in, it's, and they're choosing a t-shirt or a bottle or a stick or sticker, so the the um, data I'm writing down is words. Now I want to display this data to make it a little bit easier to read. We've kind of already done that as we've sorted it. As I was writing down the data, I'm sure it was um, t-shirt, uh, coffee mug, water bottle, sticker, sticker, water bottle, t-shirt. So it would have just been written down as a uh, kind of as a list maybe, or maybe you put tick marks beside it. I'm going to create a frequency table just to make this data a little bit um, easier to read. And we're going to have two columns. One, the first one is going to be our categories. We call those categories classes or bins. So in this case, my categories are the different gifts. So I'm just going to label it with gifts. Then in my second one, it's the frequency. So my second column has that frequency or the number of people that chose the gift. So on this side, it's the number of each of those gifts. So in this case, it was people that chose it. So we could put number chosen or the number of people who chose it or a uh, number of people then I'm just going to separate the two and then I'm going to put those gifts there. So my choices of gifts were t-shirt, coffee mug, water bottle, and bumper sticker. It might have been smart to write it up here first and then do the table around it. Then I'm just going to put the frequency of each of those. So we could use this or we could use that symbol. Remember we look to see that frequency. We just use a F there for that frequency, the number of each. So there were 40 uh, t-shirts, there were 20 coffee mugs, 10 water bottles, and 10 bumper stickers. There I have created a frequency table. So it just shows the categories of each of my data and then how many are in each of those. So what this represents is the word t-shirt written down 40 times. This 20 represents the word coffee mug written down 20 times. This 10 is 10 people who've taken water bottles. That's 10 water bottles. And this 10 represents those 10 bumper stickers. Now, all displays need to make sure that they have good labels. So here, notice I labeled each of my columns. And then they also need a title. So on the somewhere around it to let my reader know what it is that I'm, um, what is it that we're even displaying? What is this data? Well, at this one, it was gifts given at the community college. So maybe we make that our title. 
but all display should have some sort of title to let your reader know what it is that we're um, given or what it is that we're, we've, the data we've collected. Gifts given at a community college. So now we can clearly read our data to see just which gifts were given. That's a frequency table. It's just a table that shows the frequency of each category. Let's do our other example. I recently purchased a bag of plain M&Ms. The M&Ms were in six different colors. A quick count showed, quick count count, showed there were 50 M&Ms, 17 brown, 18 red, five yellow, five green, two blue, and three orange. So again, I may start with that title. So um, colors in a, colors in a bag of M&Ms. So what is it I'm showing my readers? And then my category, well, my categories are those colors. And then on this side are my frequencies. So how many of each? So number of each color or just the F for frequency. Then I'm gonna list my colors. My colors here were brown, red, yellow, green, blue, and orange. And then we just put the number for each one. So brown, there are 17, red, there are 18, yellow, there were five, green, there were five, blue, there were two, and orange, there were three. And I have created a frequency table that shows the categories on one side and the numbers on the other. So that's all a frequency table is. Frequent, all of our displays, we're gonna make sure we have labels where we need them and a title. So that's one um, frequency distribution, just to display the number in each category of our data. Let's look at bar charts or bar graphs. Bar charts and bar graphs show qualitative data and they show the frequency in each category. So this is another type of frequency display. Let's do a couple of examples and make a couple of bar charts or bar graphs. 80 visitors to a local community college were given a choice of four gifts. 40 of the visitors chose a t-shirt, 20 chose a coffee mug, 10 chose a water bottle, and 10 chose a bumper sticker. We're gonna make a bar graph to represent this data. When we make a bar graph, what we do is we have two axes. We have a vertical axis and we have a horizontal axis. Typically on the vertical axis, we put our frequencies or the number in each category. In this case, it's our number of gifts. This number of gifts is just our frequency. Then on the horizontal axis, we have our different categories. In this case, our categories are t-shirts. Just gonna label those down here. T-shirts, um, coffee mugs, And these are just the categories, that qualitative data. Water, bird, water, water bottles and bumper stickers. So down here I have all the different types of gifts. And here I have my frequency, the number of those gifts that each were chosen. All good displays have labels, just as we have put here on the axis. All good displays also have titles to let our readers know at a glance what our display is showing, what data that's showing. 
So in this case, our um, graph is showing the gifts chosen at the community college. So now to make a bar graph, what we're going to do is we're going to literally draw bars. And we're gonna draw those bars up to the height, to the frequency of what was chosen. So in this case, I need 40 t-shirts. So I need my frequencies, 40 is my largest number. I need my frequencies to make it up to that number 40. So I need to count by something along this vertical axis so that I make it up to that number 40. Maybe I count by ones if I have enough room, or I count by twos, or fives, or tens, but whatever I count by, it needs to be a consistent measure. So once I decide I'm gonna count by twos or fives, I need to count by that all the way through. So we're gonna count, you know, five, 10, 15, 20. I can't do this, I can't go five, 10, 40. Don't skip like that, it's gotta be consistent all the way. And your frequencies should always start at zero. It's really important with those frequencies to start down at zero. So here I'm gonna start at zero and I'll just count by fives. So five. Notice here that I'm gonna make this the same distance each time. So just like I talked about, it needs to be a consistent measure that I'm counting by. My, each one of these, if this, is, this distance is five, the next one, five spaces should still have that same distance. And the next one should have that same distance all the way up. So I'm just gonna put the same distance on each one, five, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, I have a little bit further I need to go, 35, 40. Then I'm gonna draw a bar above my t-shirts that reaches all the way up to 40. So I'm going to draw a bar here that reaches up to 40. Now what this bar represents is that data, 40 people that chose t-shirts or 40 t-shirts that were given away. That's what that bar represents, is inside of here are 40 t-shirts that were given away. Now, the coffee cups, so this bar literally shows the frequency, the number of gifts that were given away. Then the coffee mugs, were there were 20 given away. So this bar needs to go up to that level of 20. Now, I want my bars to also be a consistent uh, measure. So however wide I made this bar, I need to make that bar the same width so that my bars look the same. I'm not distorting it in any way by making one bar big and one bar little. These need to be consistent, just like this distance needs to be consistent. So now I'm gonna draw those lines down so that they're the same width as the one beside it. Then the water bottles are 10, so I need to make it go up to that 10 spot. And again, that same width so that I have a bar that goes up to 10 and is the same width as before. And then last but not least, another 10 for the bumper sticker. And again, that bumper sticker needs to be this same width. And rulers would be great so that my distances in between the bars and all were the same. So there is a bar graph that shows um, frequency. So our bar graph shows frequency and it shows qualitative data. There's one example, let's do one more. Let's do this re example. I recently purchased a bag of plain M&Ms. The M&Ms were in six different colors. A quick count showed there were 50 M&Ms, 17 brown, 18 red, five yellow, five green, two blue, and three orange. So the same idea, I'm gonna again have a vertical axis that starts at zero. I'm gonna have a horizontal axis where I show my um, 
bars my categories. So go ahead and redraw that. And my title is going to change. But here on my horizontal, I mean my vertical axis, I'm again going to have that frequency. These are going to be the frequencies. It's going to be the number of M&Ms that were in the bag of each color. So my largest number this time is 18. So I need to count by something to make it to 18. Uh, maybe I count by twos this time. So I have at two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16. I need one more of those distances, 18. Again, consistent measure in between. It's consistent distance each time. This represents two. Well, this also represents two, that same one. Label, number of M&Ms. So then my reader knows what that, that um, axis represents. It's the number, the frequency of those in the bag. Then along the horizontal axis, I'm gonna put my categories. In this case, my categories, my data is color, and that the different colors are the variables. So brown is one color. Red is another color. Yellow is another color. Uh, green, blue, and last but not least is orange. Then I'm gonna do the same thing where I draw my bar. My bar needs to be the same width each time. So if I decide it's gonna be that wide, then it needs to be that wide in each one of those spots. I'm just gonna put down that width all the way across so I know how wide to make it. And then, um, I go up to whatever number, so 17 brown. So I'm going to show that there are 17 browns. I'm halfway in between my 16 and my 17. And this would be much better with a ruler so that I have straighter lines. There's my brown. My red goes up to 18. 18. And my yellow is five. So again, in between the four and the six is gonna be my five. Color these in just to make them a little bit different from the white around it. Um, the green is also five. So these two should be exactly the same height and width since they represent the same amount. This bar just represents five, um, five yellow M&Ms. Picture five yellow M&Ms there. Picture five green M&Ms. That's what each of those bars represents. Two blue, so two blue. And then last but not least, three orange. Goes up halfway in between there, three orange. And then good um, graphs have labels. So these are the colors. This is the frequency or the number of, of M&Ms. And then good displays also have titles to let my um, readers know at a glance what it is, what the data represents. Colors of M&Ms in a bag. So bar graphs shows the frequency, the number, um, within our, each of our categories, uh, and it shows qualitative data. Let's look at dot plots. Dot plots are just another frequency distribution display. Dot plots can show both quantitative if data, if it's discrete data, and qualitative data. Here, we're just going to look at some qualitative data that the this dot plot can show. So dot plots have some certain characteristics. For instance, they'll have a horizontal line, but notice there's no frequency bar on the dot plot. It just has a horizontal line. And on each one, uh, on that horizontal line, we just have 
the categories that are represented by our data. And then we literally have dots on the graphic to show the um, different data that is there. So um, the dots should all be the same size so that this one dot is representing one data value and this dot represents one data value and they're the same size, width and all. And then the distance between them should be the same each time. And so if I go across, two should all be at the same height to show me that two is the same all the way across the dot plot. All of our displays have labels. So here, this is labeled and they all have titles. So those are things that you'll be looking for on a dot plot. Let's look at this particular one. The data says first graders were asked their favorite color. They recorded the data in the dot plot below. We could kind of tell that from the dot plot itself. We see that there were colors. That was the data recorded. That was our variable was the colors. So red, yellow, pink, blue, green, and rainbow. Those are um, colors are our variable. And these were the colors chosen by the students. And you can tell that also from the color, the title that they were choosing their favorite colors. Each one of these dots now we recognize represents a student. So we could count to see how many students answered the question. Let's count to see how many students were asked. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 students answered that question. Then we can, we can also look nice and easily at this dot plot just to see which color had the most. It just jumps out. These bar graphs and frequency distributions should just jump out that largest amount and the smallest amount. So like here, we can tell that pink was chosen the most and green was chosen the least. So there is a, a dot plot of that data. Let's create our own dot plot now. Here, a high school senior was planning a small party for his friends. He wanted to serve food at the party. He asked his friends, what's your favorite snack? And he collected the following data. Pizza, burger, pizza, pizza, pasta, burger, fries, pizza, fries, burger. So now I'm gonna make a dot, dot plot of this particular data. Again, with a dot plot, all I need is a horizontal axis. So I'm just gonna put down here a horizontal axis. Then along that horizontal axis, I'm gonna put the different categories of this categorical or qualitative data. So here are the different snacks and pizza was a choice. Burger was a choice. Um, pasta was a choice. Fries was a choice. And those were all the different choices. And these are snacks. So again, I'm just putting those labels on my um, axis. Then I'm just going to, for each one of these, represent that data value with a dot, or I'm going to use an X. So you can, it's a dot plot because you use dots, but sometimes people may use other symbols. That's okay as long as every one of them is the same on each one. So this pizza and this burger have to have that same X. I don't want to make one X really, really gigantic. It makes look, it look like this is much, much larger than that. It distorts my data. So I want to make sure that my X every time is exactly the same size. Pizza, pizza, another pizza. And then the pasta gets one. And again, I want to make sure my ones are all at the same level. Burger. I want to make sure that my twos are all at the same level. Fries, pizza, fries, all my twos need to be at the same level. And burger. Oh, that's here. So I've represented my data. I should have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten different. Um, data values, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So he had 10 friends that he asked. 
And those were their 10 answers. Now, the last thing I need for this dot plot is a title. So all, all, all good displays have that um, labels and a title. So these are the favorite snacks of my friends or something. So we just want to make sure with these dot plots that our whatever we choose our symbol to be, that it's the same each time, the heights are the same, equal spacing, and that type of thing. And then the dot plots are really good at showing those frequencies, and it lets us know which one has the most and which one has the least. Is 100 a big number? Well, it kind of depends on what we're comparing it to, doesn't it? I mean... If I make $10 a week or $10 a month, $100 is gonna be a lot of money. So for me to have to pay $100 when I'm making $10 a month or $10 a week, $100 is a lot I'm having to save up for. So that $100 is a lot. But if I'm making $100,000 a month, $100 is nothing. That's nothing, it's just this little bitty bit of money. So 100, it's relative to what we're comparing it to on whether or not it's big. Maybe sometimes you hear, hear talk about the United States budget and you'll hear them talk about millions of dollars and you ask yourself, is a million dollars a lot? Well, again, if we're comparing it to my salary, a million dollars is a whole lot. But if you're comparing it to the United States budget, where we're talking about billions of dollars, a million dollars is not that much. So it's all relative to what we are comparing it to. And here we're gonna talk about relative frequency displays. And that's exactly what we're talking about, is comparing a piece to the whole. Is this big or not? I don't know. It's, you know if my data value is two, is that a lot? Well, if I only talk to two people and it's all two of them, then yes, that's a lot. But if I talk to 10,000 people and I, only two of them said something, then two is not very big. So we looked at frequency, but if, how do I know if two is big or not? So here we're going to look at relative frequency. And that's all relative frequency is. It's the fraction or percentage of the data set that falls into a particular class given by. So it's just a fraction, a fraction or a percent. This says the exact same th thing. It's just a way to denote it or to write it. Here I have the frequency out of the size of my sample. Or if I have a whole population size, it's the frequency out of that population size. It's just the fraction in that category. So a fr relative frequency distribution display just displays those um, proportions of data set that belong in each class. The most famous of all of these displays, relative frequency displays, is our pie chart. The pie chart shows that percentage. So I can look and see that this category, this class, has more percentage-wise Compared to the whole population, this has more than that part. So I don't know the numbers, the frequencies, but I do know the parts of it. What fraction does this make up? So my fraction of fuzz stripes is bigger than my fraction of Oreos. So that's what that tells me. So the pie chart is the most famous of those. And that pie chart just shows those percentages or those relative frequencies. Now, our pie chart should always add up to be 100%. So here the percent is missing on this piece of the pie. By the way, I can tell by looking at this, this pie chart that there were one, two, three, four categories in my pie chart. Pie charts always show uh, qualitative data. So pie charts show qualitative data. Those different categories is what we're showing with a pie chart. So here I have four categories, but that one's missing his percent. 
So let's see if we can figure out what that percent is. Since our pie chart should always add up to 100, the first thing I'm going to do to find out that percent is just add up those three categories. This one was 40%, this is 25%, and that one was 28%. I'm just going to add those up to see what percent I have. That's 13, carry 1, 6, 7, 8, 9. So I'm at 93%. I need it to get to 100. So that means if I added another seven or if I subtract from 100, subtract that 93 from 100, I'm at 7%. So my pie chart should always add up to be the full thing, that whole, um, that whole part, uh, data set, the whole thing, which is 100% of it or one whole thing. And then each one of these is just a piece. Then I can figure out how many people answered if in each category, if I know the total number of people that uh, were surveyed. So for instance, if my sample size is um, 100, if 100 people were surveyed, then I know that 40 people said Fudge Stripe, 25 people said Oreo, 28 people said Chips Ahoy, and seven people said Kip Keebler's um, Chips Deluxe. So notice this 7%, if seven people said that, it's seven out of the 100 is how I'm getting that um, 7%. So this is that seven relative to my, um, my overall population. What if my population then is 200? How do I find out how many people said Keebler Chips Deluxe? Well, if it was seven out of 100, then out of 200, well, I multiplied by two to get there. That's 14 out of the 200. I could also do this. I could take 7% of 200 to find out that amount. So another way to find out is if we know the total number of people that were surveyed, we can just take the percent of it. So let's say that I have, um, let's use not a pretty number, like 360 people that were surveyed. If I want to know how many people said fudge stripes, I would just do 40% of that 360 to find out how many people were surveyed or how many people said fudge stripe. Or let's make this, instead of 360, let's make this um, 15,000. So then I would say 40% of that 15,000 is, uh, is how many said um, fudge stripes. So 40% of that, well, we know that 10% of that, you just move the decimal over one spot. So 10%, is 1,500, then we just do four times 1,500. Two of those is 3,000, so four of them would be 6,000. You can check my math there to make sure. So that's how we find out if we know our total number of people, then we can find out how many are in each piece. So pie charts show qualitative data and they always show relative frequency and they're our most famous of those relative frequency displays. A few things about pie charts that we always need to remember to have if we're creating our own. There should always be a title to let our reader know exactly what data is being presented here and then we should always have a key for our pie charts to let us know where to look that the Oreo matches here because this symbol is right there. So you've always got to have a key along with your pie chart. Let's talk about the degrees of a circle. So I'm going to look at this circle and here I have the center of the circle and from the center of the circle I've drawn a radius, a line out, and if I take and draw another line from that I have now created an angle inside of here, we call that an angle. And this particularly is the central angle because it's from the center of the circle. Now, in a circle, if I take and I go all the way around, 
in a circle. We call that uh, the central angle, and it's 360 degrees all the way around. So that angle there is 360 degrees. So if you ever hear someone do a 360 trick on their skateboard or their bicycle, it means that they took it and they spun all the way around. Now I'm going to take, and instead of doing a 360, I'm going to cut that in half. So instead of making a spin all the way around, I'm just going to spin halfway around. And let's think about what we think that measurement might be. What might that angle be? So here, instead of spinning all the way around, I'm now just going to spin so that I spin halfway around. I'm just going to go halfway around. Well, I'm going to take that 360 and I'm going to cut it in half to find the measure of this angle. So I'm going to take the 360 and cut it in half. Or I could say I'm multiplying it times one half. Remember when you multiply with fractions, you just multiply straight across. So we end up with 360 over 2. 2 goes into 3 one time with 1 left over. 2 goes into 16 8 times. 2 goes into 0 0 times. So if I just go around, if I just go halfway around, I've done a 180. So if you ever hear someone flip their position on something and they say they've done a 180, it means they've gone halfway around the circle, facing the other direction. Now, what if I take and I take half of that? So instead of going halfway around the circle, I just stop here so that I'm looking at this central angle, this measurement there. Again, what I'm doing is I'm taking half of that 180. Or if I were to split this circle into equal parts, I would have one, two, three, four equal parts. And each one of these central angles would be the same. So I could take this and split it in half. Or I could take the 360 and split it into four fourths. Let's try that. If I take the 360, 360 degrees all the way around, and I split it into one, two, three, four equal pieces, so that I have 360 times one fourth. Again, remember when we multiply fractions, we just multiply straight across, top times top, bottom times bottom. Four goes into 36, nine times. 4 goes into 0, 0 times. So this degree is a 90 degree angle. That central measure, that angle of the uh, central measure there is 90 degrees. Notice also if I had taken 180 and split it in half, divided it by 2, I would get 90. I'm going to do that one more time where we take and we split that as well in half. So that I'm just taking that 90 and splitting it in half. And if I look at how many equal pieces I would have in my circle, I would have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So this angle is 1 eighth of my entire circle. And I could do that same thing where I just take 360 times 1 eighth. Or I'm just taking this and splitting it in half. Let's see, if I split that in half, multiply this by 1 eighth, what do I get? Well, 360 divided by 8, 8 goes into 36, 4 times, 4 times 8 is 32, so I have four left over. I'm going to write that little four that's left over right there. Eight goes into 45 times. So that's a 45 degree angle. These are called the measure of the central angle. 
and we denote that or we write it, we say the measure of the angle is equal to whichever angle I'm looking at. So I may call that angle A there. So that angle, the measure of that angle is equal to 45 degrees. So this little notation just means the measure of the angle. Notice in order for us to find the measure of the angle each time, all we did was take the fraction of the circle and multiply it times the total number of degrees in our circle. So to find the measure of the central angle, to find the measure of the central angle, we just multiply the 360 times our fraction. So whatever the fraction is. Here, let me just say times fraction. Well, what about if I had a percent instead? You guys know that I could call this um, one half across, but I could also call that 50% because one half is the same as 50%. Well, to find out that measure of the angle for 50%, we do the exact same thing. We just take the 360 and multiply it times, I could say this is 50% because 50% is the same as that half. So times 50%. Remember when we multiply by percent, it's just percent is just 50 over 100, because percent is always out of 100. Then when I multiply, I can reduce or simplify first these zeros if I divide both the top and the bottom by 10. I can reduce this zero and that zero. So I'm really just multiplying 36 times five. Five times six is 30, carry a three, five times um, 3 is 15, 5 times 3 is 15, 16, 17, 18 that I carried. Notice that whether I'm multiplying by 50% or by 1 half, the measure there of that central angle is still 180 degrees. And how did I find the measure of that central angle? I'm just multiplying 360 times that percent. So to find the measure of the central angle, we just multiply by our 360 by our fraction, or we can multiply our 360 times our percent to get the measure of the central angle. Let's practice. Let's find the central, the measure of the central angle for each piece of this um, pie chart. Here we have a pie chart that shows the favorite fruit of whoever was surveyed. And it says 25% of those surveyed liked apples. What we want to know is what is the measure, what is the measure of the central angle? What is the measure of the central angle? For each piece. Well, to find that out, all we do is take our 360, that's the whole circle, and we look to see what fraction we're looking at or what piece we're looking at. In this case, it's times 25%. So I could do 360 times 0.25 because 0.25 is the same as 25%. I could do 360 times um, 25 over 100 because 25 over 100 is equal to 25%. All of those things would work. 360 times, let's just leave it at 25 over 100. I'm gonna simplify to help me, but you can do it times a decimal as well. I'm gonna simplify to help me. Remember that um, we can simplify our fraction. So 25 goes into 100 four times. So I'm really doing 360 times 1 fourth, 
which we saw earlier was 90 degrees. So the measure of the central angle for apples is equal to 90 degrees. The measure of the angle for apples is equal to 90 degrees. Let's do one more. What about um, the oranges? Let's find the degree for oranges. That's not one we've done before. So what is the degree for oranges? Well, we take 360 degrees all the way around and we just multiply it times the percent. So times 30%. We can use our 10% rule there to help us out with this. Remember 10% of 360 is just 336. And then we need three of those, so we're just gonna double it. So 36 times three is the same thing because 10% of it would be 36, and we need three of those, so we can just triple it. 18 carry one nine, 108 degrees. Or you can multiply it times 0.3 if that helps you, or we could do it as that fraction, 30 over 100, and you'll see that this zero and that zero cancel out because it's a 10 divided by 10 over 10, this 10 goes in there to make it 36, and you really are just doing 36 times three. So the measure of the um, central angle for oranges is equal to 108 degrees. So as we make pie charts here later, we'll need to know the measure of our central angle. And the way we find that out is we simply multiply 360 degrees by the fraction or 360 degrees by the percent. In this video, we have an example of a survey of students' favorite after-school activities. We're gonna use the data from this to answer a few questions. So a survey of students' favorite after-school activities was conducted at a school. The survey yielded the following results. 45 students chose play sports, 66 chose talk on the phone, 27 chose earn money, 21 chose school clubs, 75 chose go online, and 66 chose hang out with friends. Let's answer a few questions concerning that data. I want to know what fraction of students chose play sports. So remember when we're creating a fraction, it's the part out of the whole. So the first thing we will need is the total number of students that were surveyed. In order to find that total number of students, we're gonna add up all of the students. So we're gonna take 45 plus 66 plus 27, I'll do those three first. So that's 11 plus seven makes 18, carry your one, five, 11, 12, 13. Let's add the rest of them. So 21, 75, and 66. Just making it a little bit easier on myself to do the addition. So I have six plus six makes 12, carry your one. Three plus seven is 10, plus six is 16. So I'm gonna add these half plus that half, 138 plus the 162, that's 10, carry your one, nine, 10, carry my one. So there were 300 total students surveyed. This 300 is the total number of students. Now, what we do to find the fraction is we take our piece out of our whole, and we wanna know the fractions of students that chose play sports. So if we look at the students that play, chose play sports, there are 45 of those. So I'm gonna take 45 out of my total of 300. And there's my fraction of those who, who chose play sports. Let's reduce or simplify that fraction. If it's 45 out of 300 students, well, we could take the top and the bottom and divide by five, I know I can divide by five because this one ends in a five and that one ends in a zero. 
So both of them are divisible by five. So we have nine over, well, five goes into 30 six times, five goes into zero, zero times. I think I can continue to reduce that because three goes into both nine and into 60. So I can reduce this or simplify it by three over three. That equals, well, nine divided by three is three and 60 divided by three is 20. So 45 out of the 300 students said play sports. If I only looked at 60 of the students, then nine out of those 60 said play sports. If I only look at 20 of the students, then three out of the 20 would be expected to have said choose sports. So there's that simplified version of the fraction of those who chose play sports. Let's answer the next question. What percent of students said earn money? So same idea, because remember that a percent is just a fraction. So I know now the total number of students. I don't have to re-add that. That's going to be my denominator. So anytime I'm finding that percent, what percent, I know I'm really just trying to find a fraction. So I have my total number. I want to know those that say earn money. Well, there were 27 of those that said earn money. So the fraction is 27 out of the 300 students said earn money. I want it as a percent. Remember that percent is just this fraction with a hundred in my denominator. So I think to myself, what do I need to divide this by to get down to 100 in my denominator? In order to see what the percent is, I need that denominator to be a hundred. Well, if I divide this bottom by three, that will move me down to 100. It will equal 100. So if I divide the bottom by 3, I have to divide the top by 3 because I'm really just dividing by that fancy 1. 27 divided by 3 then is 9. So 9%, because remember that 9 out of 100 is the fraction, but the percent then you just write, take that 100 in the denominator and turn it into a percent sign. So nine out of 100 students said earn money, or 9% of the students said earn money. Last but not least, if a pie chart was created of the results, what would be the measure of the central angle for hang out with friends? Remember that to find the measure of the central angle, that what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the percent or the fraction and multiply it times 360 degrees times the fraction or the percent. So that's how we find that measure of the central angle. So the measure of the central angle is equal to 360 times that fraction of percent. So the first thing we need to do is find the fraction for hang out with friends. Well, we know that the denominator is going to be 300, so there's 300 total students. There were 66 of them that said hang out with friends. I'm going to multiply that times the 360 degrees to find the measure of the central angle. I could do some simplification, or I could just simply multiply. Let's go ahead and do some simplification. I know that 6 goes into my top and to, into the bottom. It's even, and three goes into both of them. So I can simplify that, just to make it a little easier for me. Six goes into this part 11 times, because six goes in here one time, six goes in there one time. Six goes into 300, well, six goes into 35 times. Six goes into zero, zero times. I didn't do anything with that 360, so I'll leave it there. As I multiply across, this 360 is going to be on top, and the 50, 11 times 360 will be on top, and the 50 will be on bottom. So I'm going to go ahead and divide this top by 10 and this bottom by 10. So now I'm just left with 11 times 36 all over 5. Notice the top, 11 times 36 divided by 5. 
You might have to go off to the side and do this multiplication of 11 times 36. I know the 11's trick where I write down the last number. I add the two digits, 36 plus, uh, I mean, 3 plus 6 gives me 9, and then I write down the first one. But if you go off to the side and you see that 11 times 36 is just 360 by 96. I have to divide that by the 5 now. So 5 goes into um, 39, 7 times with 4 left over. 5 goes into 46, 9 times with 1 left over. Notice that 1 though is a remainder, so it's 1 fifth left over. Or I could stick a 0 on the end, make this a decimal, and say 5 goes into 10 2 times. So the degree of that central angle is going to be 79.2 or 79 and 2 tenths degree. This is the degree of that central angle. So there's an example of a data collection and some questions answered from it. Let's look at some relative frequency displays. We've made some frequency displays where we showed the frequency, the number of data sets in each category. First, we made frequency tables that just show how many there are in each category. So in this case, their gifts were chosen. And our example says 80 visitors to a local community college were given a chance of four gifts. 40 visitors chose t-shirts, 20 chose a coffee mug, 10 chose water bottle, and 10 chose a bumper sticker. And so our frequency table just shows that, that there were 40 t-shirts chosen, 20 coffee mugs, 10 water bottles, and 10 bumper stickers. That was our frequency table. And we also made a bar graph that showed those same frequencies, that we had 40 t-shirts, 20 coffee mugs, 10 water bottles, and 10 bumper stickers. In this video, we're going to look at turning those into relative frequency displays. So 40 in, re in relation to how many? Is 40 a big number? Is it a small number? It kind of depends on how many are in our total set. So when we talk about a relative frequency display, in order to turn this into a relative frequency table, all I'm going to do is take my 40 and tell you how many total that it's out of. So it was 40 out of, well, how many total visitors were there? We could add up all the numbers to find out, or within our example, it tells us there were 80. So to make this into a relative frequency, I just turned this from 40 into 40 out of 80. Or we can reduce that fraction down to one half. We could also write that as a percent. We could write it as 50%. Here, that 20, again, I'm just gonna show it out of what? To make it into a relative frequency distribution, we just take that and show out of the total number of 80. Again, I'm gonna reduce that fraction. 20 over 80 is equal to 1 fourth. So we could write it as one-fourth, that simplified fraction, or we could also show it as a percent, because a percent is also just a fraction. So one-fourth is the same as writing 25%. Here, I could write that as 10 out of 80, or just one-eighth. So 10 out of that total number, and here as well, 10 out of that total number, or one-eighth. So in a relative frequency distribution, all we do is take each one of our frequencies and put it over the total amount to show the fraction of people who chose that gift. So instead of saying the number that chose the, chose the gift, this title now needs to become the fraction that chose the gift. Or if I had made them percents, my label would just say percents that chose. Now it is a relative frequency display. 
I'm going to do the same thing here. I'm going to turn it into a relative frequency display. So instead of counting by fives, I need to count by that fraction or maybe by the percent. I can use the fractions that I made here. I know that this one is one half. I know that um, this one is one fourth. And I know that the water bottle down here is one eighth. I can also just take that and put it over the 80. So five out of 80 is equal to 1 16th. So really I am counting here by 1 16th. If I count up by 1 16th, here it's 1 16th. The next one would be 2 16th, but 2 16th reduces to 1 8th. Hey, that's the same as what we got there, 1 8th. Then the next one, 1 16th, 2 16th, the next one would be 3 16th, that doesn't reduce. 4 16th does reduce to 1 4th. The next one is 5 16th, then 6 16th, which reduces. Um, 2 goes into 6 3 times, and 2 goes into 16 8 times. So, 5 sixteenths, 6 sixteenths, 7 sixteenths, and then the last one is 8 sixteenths or 1 half. So I've turned this bar graph that showed frequencies into a relative frequency bar graph. Again, instead of having the number chosen, now this is the fraction chosen. Or if we write it with our frequency, we could say it's the frequency over the total number in our sample there of people who chose gifts. Or if it's a population, you can make it a capital N. So all you do to make a frequency distribution into a relative frequency distribution is change it into a, a fraction, show out of the total number. Here, um, we can do the same thing with our M&Ms. So our M&Ms, we made a frequency table to show that there were 17 brown M&Ms in the bag. I'll read the example real quickly. I recently purchased a bag of M&Ms. The M&Ms were in six colors. A quick count showed there were 50 M&Ms. 17 brown, 18 red, five yellow, five green, two blue, and three orange. So we showed the frequency of each of the colors on our frequency table and on our bar uh, graph. Now we're gonna turn these into relative frequency displays. And all we have to do to do that is make it into a fraction or a percent. So I'm gonna take that 17 and put it over 50. Let's turn it this time into a percent. So 17 over 50, remember that percent is always out of 100. To get this bottom to 100, we would multiply by two. So we would also multiply the top by two so this is equal to 34%. We can do the same thing here. Our 18 is 18 over 50. Again, percent would have a denominator of 100. Multiply the bottom by two, multiply the top by two. So this is equal to 36%. Turn that denominator into a percent sign. Five out of 50, multiply the top and the bottom by two, so that's equal to 10%. And so this one as well will be equal to 10%. Two out of 50, multiply the top and the bottom by two, and you get 4%. And last but not least, three out of 50, or multiply by two, top and bottom, and you get 6%. So 6% of my bag was made up of orange M&Ms. So to show that relative frequency display, I'm gonna show it in percents. I just took each one of those and put them over the total number of M&Ms that there were, changed those into percents, and now my label needs to say the percent of each color in a bag. I'm going to do the same thing here. I'm going to count by those percents. I'm counting by um, twos here, but if we notice that the twos was 4%. So I'm really counting by 4% here. So if this one is 4%, if 
I continue to count by the percent, this would be 8%. This would be 10%. This would be 12%. Oh no, I quit counting by, that didn't make sense. That's 12%. This is 16%. That makes more sense because multiply by two. 20%, count by fours. Remember four, eight, 12, 16, 20, 24%. 28%, 32%, 36%, and then last but not least would be 40%. And we can check ourselves by noticing that our brown should make it up to 34%. Well, in between 32 and 36 would be 34%. Again, instead of having the frequencies now, I have the percent of those colors in a bag. So to turn, to create a relative frequency display, all we do is take our frequency displays and rewrite those frequencies over the total number. Create that fraction or turn it into a percent to show that out of the whole, how many are there. So a two-way table organizes data collected from two different variables, usually qualitative or qual uh, categorical um, variables and examines the relationship between that bivariate data. When we talk about two variables, we use this word bivariate. So um, we're gonna look at the data collected from two different variables and put them on a two-way table to be able to examine that relationship. So here's a scenario where we might use a two-way table. Researchers gather measurements from athletes and spectators at a charity 5K run and organize the information on this two-way table. So here I have two different variables. In our two different, uh, in our two-way tables, we'll put one variable, the um, data collected or the answers to one variable along one side and the answers collected from another variable along another side. So here along the top, um, our variable is what is the um, position of a person at the 5K? And those people would either be athletes or spectators. So this is the position that they held at the 5K. Then along here is our other variable. So at the 5K, we measured, took measurements from them and those measurements were of blood pressure. And when we measured their blood pressure, we put them into two categories either high blood pressure or normal blood pressure. So along here, the variable is what was their blood pressure, normal or high? So now that we have our two variables on the chart, then we begin to fill in the chart. And our chart should always, in a two-way table, your columns should add up. So this, um, the number of athletes with high blood pressure our normal blood pressure and the number of athletes with high blood pressure should add up to be the total number of athletes. Your number of spectators with normal blood pressure and the number of spectators with high blood pressure should add up to the, be the total number of spectators. So here we know we had 20 total spectators. That's what that 20 tells us. And this is the total number of our blood pressure. So we had 10 people, athletes and spectators, 10 people had normal blood pressure. This two is the high blood pressure and an athlete. So we had two athletes with high blood pressure. This bottom is the total number of athletes and spectators and the total number of people who attended our 5K. So we had 30 total people that attended the 5K. We've only filled in a few of the values, but once we have a few of the values, we can fill in the rest just by adding and subtracting. So here, if I know I have 30 total people and 10 of them had normal blood pressure, if I do a little subtraction, I can find that 20 people had high blood pressure. Again, if I have 30 total people and 20 of them were spectators, 
then with a little subtraction, I can find out that I had 10 athletes. I had 10 total athletes. Two of them had high blood pressure. That tells me that I had eight people with normal blood pressure, eight athletes with normal blood pressure. Then if I had 10 total people with normal blood pressure and eight of them were athletes, that means two of them subtracting were spectators. So two spectators had normal blood pressure. And again, just subtracting this 20 total people with high blood pressure, two of them um, were athletes. That means that 18 were spectators. Notice that I can add up my columns and add up my rows and it all adds up. Eight plus two is 10, two plus 18 is 20, 10 plus 20 is 30. This direction, eight plus two is 10, two plus 18 is 20, and 10 plus 20 is 30. So my columns and rows have to add up. Then I can begin to look at the, the um, two-way table and notice certain relationships. Like for instance, um, more of the people with high blood pressure were spectators, whereas my athletes had more normal um, blood pressure. So that's how we compare the relationship then between those two variables. So there's an example of a two-way table. Math made simple at Simpson Math. Thanks for watching.